My name is James O'Shaughnessy, Senior Fellow of the Jubilee Centre, Member of the House of Lords, and I will be chairing tonight's session. Over the course of the last 25 years, we've seen multiple policies from across the political spectrum that have sought to recognise and develop the formative role of institutions in encouraging citizen engagement and participation in their communities. To a greater or lesser extent, these policies have all sought to cultivate the civic and other virtues needed for vibrant and flourishing communities. Yet questions remain about the role and nature of formative institutions within democracy today. Through the short presentations from our speakers and then together in conversation, we are going to consider a number of important questions tonight, including how do existing institutions have to change to foster civic virtues and underpin the common good? Do we need new institutions and how might these institutions be successfully embedded into local and national life? What is the role of the state in developing the civic virtues of its citizens? What role does non-state institutions play? And what are the best examples of state and non-state institutions that contribute to a strong civic life? And what are the barriers to building institutions that bring citizens together to enable them to exercise civic virtue and help communities to flourish? How might these challenges be overcome? Those are just some of the questions which we are exploring this evening. A quick word about the Jubilee Centre. For those of you who don't know us, we're a pioneering, applied and award-winning interdisciplinary research centre based at the University of Birmingham, focusing on character, virtues and values in the interest of human flourishing. Launched just over 10 years ago, the centre promotes a moral concept of character in order to explore the importance of virtue for public and professional life. You can find out more information about the Jubilee Centre on the website, jubileecentre.ac.uk. And the Civic Virtues Through Service project um, looks at how service can be used as a focus for, um, for developing civic virtue in contemporary public life and education in the UK. Through researching education for civic character and youth social action, the project is examining how service helps to connect young people to, other, uh, to others and to their communities, enabling them to promote the common good. More details of the project and contact details are, on the, uh, are available on the centre website, as are links to previous webinars in this series. Finally, I should note that there is a recording going on. The recording will be uploaded the next day. And if you want to participate, which I very much hope you do, after our speakers have spoken, there is the, either the Q&A function or the chat. Now, without further ado, I want to introduce our two fantastic speakers this evening. First of all, we have uh, the Right Honourable Jesse Norman MP, um, a Conservative MP for Hereford and South Herefordshire, former Paymaster General and Minister of State. Uh, he has also served as Chair of the DCMS Committee. Before entering politics, Jesse was a director at Barclays. He was involved in policy research, uh, including, I'm delighted to say, as a former colleague at Policy Exchange, where he published uh, books and pamphlets like Compassion Compassionate Conservatism and The Big Society. And his book, Edmund Burke, Politician, Philosopher and Prophet, was listed for the Samuel Johnson Prize, the Political Book Awards and, George, and the George Orwell Prize. Welcome, Jesse. We also have Professor John Denham. John was the MP for Southampton Itchen from 1992 until he stood down at the 2015 election and held a variety of cabinet and ministerial positions in the last Labour government. Since then, he's founded and is director of the Southern Policy Centre, which works on developing regional strategy, devolution, widening participation and addressing poverty in su southern England and as well as youth issues. And in addition to this role, he's a professorial fellow at Southampton University, where he was director of the Centre for English Identity and Politics. I should also note that we have a, a dropout, unfortunately, from our speakers uh, tonight, which also explains our less than diverse panel. Um, in terms of what we're going to do uh, for the agenda, um, you're shortly going to hear from Jesse first, who will speak to us for around seven to ten minutes, and then John, who will speak to us for around ten to twelve minutes, will then be able to open up the floor to Q&A from all of you and close just after six. So hopefully that is all clear. And at that point, it gives me enormous pleasure to hand over to Jesse, who is going to talk first. Jesse, over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, James. And thank you to the Jubilee Centre for this wonderful opportunity to talk about this very interesting set of issues and questions. And as James knows, and uh, as some of you who've watched other stuff that I've done will know, I come to this very much as a student of Burke and Smith and the whole point of some of the work that I did with James at Policy Exchange and then afterwards was to try to rehabilitate an understanding of politics and of society that derived from 
these great Burkean and Smithian insights. And of course, those are insights fundamentally about institutions uh, and also indirectly about character in ways that I think bear on the kinds of conversations that we'll be having. So Burke famously is the philosopher of institutions, talks about the little platoons that sustain society. And he thinks of society as an inestimable benefit and a, uh, an inheritance that has been bequeathed to us, whose complexity and uh, strength and the affordances that it uh, gives collectively uh, offer us a, a kind of capacity to live our lives well and freely. And this does not mean for a second that he accepts all of the negative uh, aspects of a society that we may have inherited. He's no friend of injustice. So his reforming conservatism is about taking institutions, making them work better where they need to be reformed, but understanding the affordances that society give us. And in a world in which we've just been with COVID uh, and with the even the simplest actions of our own being very much enabled at the well-being of others, in particular wearing masks, something that doesn't particularly help individuals, but which collectively made a rule is enormously beneficial to others socially. This idea of institutions and practices as giving affordances to people is, I think, as pregnant now as uh, it might have been when Burke first started thinking about these ideas. Now, from Smith's standpoint, what is so fascinating about Smith is, a, is, a, is that he's a theorist of, of markets, of course, and of the state, but he's also a theorist of human behavior. And in the theory of moral sentiments, he talks about the natural sympathy that exists between individuals and very much at length about character and how character uh, is built up. And for him, what the components of good character would be. And he contrasts this in politics between the, as it were, statesmanlike uh, 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 adherence to principle that he thinks of as, as great political leaders, uh, a characteristic of great political leaders, and then a certain kind of rat-like cunning that he associates with uh, vulgar politics. And he understands that there's probably going to be both in, uh, in political life, but he doesn't think that necessarily means that we shouldn't differentiate between them. And his idea of human well-being in markets is very much one in which the moral exchange of regard that drives our values and that drives our cultural and social norms is the parallel to the exchange of goods and services that we find in our markets. And so those things come together. So the idea of a, of a market that has been somehow disaggregated or, or disenfranchised or cut off, atomized from its social and legal and moral roots is incoherent for him and, in his, and also more particularly in his theory. And those two uh, great thinkers have uh, between them, this very Aristotelian idea, just to give it an, an intellectual anchoring, that man is above all social, and of course women, above all social animals, and that their uh, interactions are what uh, determine their mutual well-being, and indeed their mutual freedoms. Now, how does this bear on the idea of character and virtue? I think very directly. So what it suggests is that we should take seriously this Aristotelian idea that practice leads ultimately to virtue and that we even if we don't possess a virtue we can acquire it by practicing uh, it and by living our lives according to it and that in this the same is true not just of individuals but of institutions and that institutions acquire their validity and strength by operating more or less perfectly according to laws or rules that they set themselves and that become their guiding and defining purpose and that when institutions are cut off from society or when individuals are cut off from society, we're formally incapable of understanding how they uh, operate and indeed how they should operate and the relationship between them. And I think that's an extraordinarily powerful and important insight. So how then does this work? Well, I, I think it works at several levels. The first is in terms of our practice, the way we behave. The second is in terms of the way we talk about our practice, our rhetoric our ability to persuade others, the assumptions we bring to the table when we engage with others, the virtues of a civic conversation, if you like, which takes others as presumptively equal 
and gives a respect. This is an Okshotian thought, a respect to the uh, not just to the views of others, but to the status which they bring to the constitutions, people to be valued as, as presumptive equals. And out of that rich conversation comes the idea of, of a culture and therefore a society in this, in this deep sense. I think all those things go together. If we're thinking about the kinds of institutions that might lead us to better character, therefore, we have to think about ways in which we can be given moral examples or uh, cultural examples that encourage us to shape through institutions our own behavior. Now, of course, very much for uh, people in this country over many centuries, institutions that will do that will be institutions of marriage, um, institutions of uh, private property and contract. Uh, but of course, they also include uh, institutions such uh, uh, that sit around our constitution. Um, a little example would be the selection of candidates. You will have seen that Michael Crick has just launched a new project to look into how political parties select candidates and to do so uh, in a way that is perhaps reflective of, uh, of, of virtue in part. Where does virtue come from? It comes from our experience. We don't want uh, brains on sticks going into public life. And if we do, let them be a small part of it and let the people who are actually taking decisions on behalf of the public good be people who are not only able to make an argument publicly, but to think about the basic presuppositions of that and have the experience of acting and have the experience of family life, perhaps, or of running a team or of managing a budget or of taking responsibility. Those are the things that are going to be breeding virtue. Let me say a couple of other things uh, finally. So uh, in Hereford, I'm setting up a university at the moment called the New Model Institute for Technology and Engineering. And it doesn't uh, have a preaching aspect to it. It's got no religious component to it, but it's very, very much focused on this virtue enabled conception of human flourishing. So it doesn't say we'll just take the cleverest people we can possibly find. It says you have to be clever enough to do this very difficult masters in engineering course every hour validated by the Open University. But once we know, once you've persuaded us as an academic faculty that you're able to do the course, then we select for your ability to cooperate with others, your passion, your creativity, your resilience, because those are the virtues that are actually going to feed into our life as an institution and that we can help you to build as you go out into the world. And therefore, what comes out of this experience is not just an individual who's received some knowledge, but an individual who's practiced that knowledge through genuine engineering on projects and also had the opportunity to be selected and to live by certain virtues that we hope they'll go out into the world and magnify in their own lives. Now, at a time when I'm afraid to say people, senior people in political life uh, are widely suspected of a lack of virtue, a lack of honesty, a lack of transparency, a lack of trustworthiness. The questions that we're debating today could hardly be more pungent or more important. And it's a tragedy to think that our constitution itself is reliant on the good chap theory of government, as Peter Hennessy once put it. But it is, and of course, so is the United States Constitution, as Donald Trump has indicated, shown by not abiding by the results of the previous uh, election and respecting the results of the presidential election. So these issues are absolutely current, they're absolutely saying we should be thinking about them now. We'll never emancipate either a written codified constitution like the American one or our own unwritten evolved constitution from the need to be a good person who respects others and honours the tacit norms and rules of our practice. But we can be better at it and we can choose better leaders that do the job. And I hope with your work, the Jubilee Centre, we will do that. Thank you very much. Jesse, thank you uh, very much for giving that a grounding, I think, not just in philosophy, but history and, 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 um, and political theory as well. I'm, I've got lots of questions and I can't resist the urge to ask one before I hand over to John. I hope you don't mind. Um, but it was very clear from your work on Adam Smith, for example, when you compare it to sort of the political economy of today, that he gave in a sense equal prominence to the role of the economy as to society and we just do not seem to be capable of uh, conducting uh, a national conversation which puts those two on a par we are bound with economists economic theories commentators numbers uh, gdp stats you name it policy indeed in that area but by contrast 
um, our discussion around what it takes to build a healthy, flourishing society is pretty thin. And notwithstanding your own excellent contributions in this area, why is that? Um, what's changed in 200 years? Is it the obvious thing, the decline of religion? Uh, if so, what might replace it? So I wonder if you could expand on that a little. I mean, that's a fabulous question, James. Thank you so much. And uh, all your viewers are going to have to uh, accept my apologies, but I'm going to give a remorseless trail for my book on Adam Smith. But it, it is astonishing how prescient Smith is. And let me just pick up a little bit how that is and then show why it relates to your question. So, so Smith, we don't normally, we think of Smith as a, as a person who writes about economics and markets. Uh, we would be very surprised, I think, to find Smith as a man who predicts the existence of virtue signaling or microaggressions or celebrity culture or materialism or the softness that comes with too much opulence in commercial society, which we're seeing now in relation to our inability as a society to come to terms with what it might be to support Ukraine. And so uh, um, Smith is just unbelievably good on those. And of course, he's got a view of society in which character is intrinsically linked. So these things all have a have a basis in understanding of human character and they have an in, uh, a, a relationship. I mean, when people grow up in a certain way, they have a character and their society is formed in that way. And so are their markets. Now, in relation to your question, he also has a very developed theory of the state. So, of course, the idea that somehow markets are independent of the state, somehow the state should be cut away, minimalist government, hopelessly, first of all, is the council of despair, uh, but it's also hopelessly inaccurate to a proper reconstruction of Smith. Uh, as societies evolve, as property becomes more and more uh, disparate and uh, different things become subject to property rights, they need property guarantees, they need a state to do that, but they also need, of course, norms that go with that. And so all of this, as it were, evolutionary theory develops, you know, uh, 50 years before Charles Darwin, who in many ways based his own theory on it. Uh, and it retains its pungency for us now. Now, if we think about the question you asked, why have these questions of value dropped out of the equation? I think there are several reasons. One is to kind of religion, as you've said. Uh, a second is that uh, people in public life never, and with very good reason, like to talk about moral uh, behavior because so often their own behavior is incredibly suspect and more and more and more precisely because politics itself is an intrinsically qualified activity so if you have a choice as john will know very well if you have a choice between building the the runway or protecting the wetland there's no right answer to that question you have to have a political debate that just encompasses all of the rights and wrongs to try to reach a, a solution and any solution you have will be one that offends some people and arguably crosses or damages some public moral norm. So it's an intrinsically flawed activity. And if it has any heroism, politics uh, has the heroism of being something that's worth pursuing even when you know this. But there is a final reason, which I think is actually really important that goes beyond that, which is that we've allowed our discussion of political economy to, de to be debased into a discussion purely in terms of economics. And that's implied a thoroughly technocratic view of well-being, a utilitarian view that just bases uh, decisions on cost-benefit analysis. The trouble with that is that what it misses is the not only any discussion of human values, which of course we can perfectly reasonably discuss without preaching or moralizing, just what the values are, we can discuss them descriptively, but it's also the case that it misses out as it were, any requirement to be self-conscious about thinking or talking about human values. And so is it any reason, is it any surprise, to take an example, that people fell upon the moral certitudes, however flawed they may have been, of Donald Trump, uh, when that debate had been enabled by a Bill Clinton and a Barack Obama who simply refused to engage with some fundamental moral issues about human freedom and human well-being. Is it any reason, is it any surprise that we've seen some of the extraordinary changes in uh, legal and uh, moral uh, well-being, particularly in the United States, I don't need to remind you, recently, when people aren't discussing issues of value. And I fear the same thing may be true here. And it's abetted by, our final thought, these microclimates and these echo chambers in uh, in social media. and. I suppose the area where I see that the most is in relation to the treatment of women, which is becoming clearly misogynistic and fueled by many of these 
ugly subcultures. And we've got to find a way of fighting against that and, and building a richer and more and more genuinely inclusive civic conversation. Thank you, Jesse. And you, you highlight there, I think, the, the risks in highlighting, in, in, in pursuing what might be described as a neutral or amoral stand, is there is no such thing. Uh, and it lets in the kind of bad behaviours that you've just described. Jesse, brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, John, I'm going to hand over to you now um, for your presentation. And I, I may also chuck a question away afterwards and then we'll open up to the floor. So just again, a reminder to people to use the chat, to use the Q&A function if there's anything you want to lodge, any questions you want to ask our speakers. John, over to you. James, thank you very much. And it, it's good to be at the Jubilee Centre and, and, and good to be discussing things with Jesse. I, what I say is going to sound very different, but I think it's exploring some of the same issues from a different angle. But I'm actually going to talk about the nation and the state, and I'm specifically going to talk about England. And I'm going to argue that a nation that cannot express itself as a nation will struggle to find a politics of the common good and struggle to have a full expression of civic virtue. Now, you'll wonder, why on earth are you talking about England? Well, if you think about it, outside of sport, you will rarely see an expression of 21st century England. You're more likely to see caricature of the far-right extremism or xenophobia, totally belying the true range of views of the four, or five, four out of five people who say they're strongly English. So we need to talk about England. And it's commonplace to say that we're divided because of geography, race, class, income, wealth, education, our lives are very different from one to another. Inflation's not gonna hit us all in the same way. But most recently, and most obviously, we have been divided by Brexit. Brexit was a debate across the United Kingdom, but most sharply divided us in England. So much so that being a Remainer or a Lever became part of who we were as individuals. Now, perhaps some of those most intense feelings have dimmed, but at the heart lay very different conceptions of the nation, ideas of identity, understandings of sovereignty. And without plowing too much into the political science, those who were most likely to vote leave were those who were most likely to say they're more English than British. They had long thought that Brussels had too much say. They would rather have seen Scotland and Northern Ireland leave the Union than forego Brexit. Um, those most likely to vote remain were those who were more British than English. Some rejected being English at all, more likely to be European, much less concerned about pooling sovereignty in the EU. And those contested views of the nation dominated the get Brexit done election in 2019. 80% of the more English voted Conservative. Corbyn's Labour actually won amongst the more British. And my question I want to raise tonight is, how do we respond to that? I mean, one response, obviously, is to say, well, we just shrug our shoulders and hope that our side, whichever side that is, wins next time. And as a still partisan Labour politico, I, I know which side I want to win in such a battle. But actually, it's not an adequate response. I mean, suppose the labour -y, Lib dem -y, remainer -y side wins next time. We would still be a divided nation, divided by our ideas of what England should be and also of what the United Kingdom should be. And the reason this matters is that this is no world for a divided nation. Nations remain the primary focus of political action. The internationalism we need can only be built on the cohesion of nations. And it's a hard time for internationalism. The world is dividing into geopolitical blocks. The rule-based order no longer enforceable by the USA and its allies is crumbling. We face, obviously, naked aggression environmental collapse, huge migratory flows, stumbling economies. Only confident and cohesive nations will manage these crises and keep internationalism alive. And I'd suggest tonight that only nations that can find a national politics of the common good will be up to the job. And that's the challenge for us. Now, at one level, there are grounds for optimism. We now have numerous segmentation studies. They, they use polling and focus groups, and they all show the same picture. We're not a society divided down the, the middle. It's more that we're a myriad of groups or tribes who share similar values, but often with large areas of common ground of values and policy between them. The noisy polls of public debate that Jesse just referred to rarely represent real divides. Outside social media, few of us want a nation with no immigration and fewer nation with no borders. We are neither all empire loyalists nor people who can find no good in our history. 
you might think that sounds like an appeal for middle ground policy, but it's we need more than that. We will never all agree on every policy after all. A cohesive nation is one in which we share a sense of belonging, a commitment to each other that goes beyond finding areas of agreement, a, a willingness to look out for each other. Uh, that for tonight is where I locate civic virtue in finding the common ground and expressing an idea of the common good that can bring us together. And this really is something we should conceive of as nation building. And this is where our institutions fail us to bring in the institutional di dimension. Because where in England can we find a forum in which those debates about the future and nature of the nation can be properly discussed? We have no such forum. Indeed, England has no political identity or expression at all in, polit in politics. England is re re routinely referred to as the country or even Britain by government and opposition alike. For 20 years, England's had its own policy on education, health and many other issues. But England is still governed by the UK government and the Union state, which actually is a badly coordinated mishmash of departments, some of which are UK wide, some British, some Welsh and English, some English only. England has no financial settlement. There is no English discussion about priorities. So the Treasury incompetently micromanages every decision. There is no discrete machinery of government at civil service level to set priorities or coordinate policy delivery. And certainly no minister is responsible for what happens in England as England. And of course, England has no democratic national forum at all. The Commons has a majority of MPs from England, obviously, but it does not function as a parliament or legislature for England. And I would argue that it's no coincidence that Brexit divided England so deeply, because England's the only part of the United Kingdom that has had no national debate, let alone a referendum on how it wishes to be governed in the last 20 years. There's no time to explore the historical roots of this marginalization. Suffice to say that England's navigating a transition from a nation once at the heart of the union, at the heart of empire, a nation that needed no particular national identity to one in which in a very different world, we are no longer sure who we are. So amongst our neighbors in England, we'll find some who emphasize national sovereignty and democracy, some who express a traditional unionism with England firmly at its center, and others a cosmopolitan, liberal, and scarcely patriotic Britishness that doesn't really prioritize the nation state at all. But if we want to develop and express a national politics of the common good, England has to overcome its past and shape its future. Now, this is a debate that needs to run in civic society amongst faith organizations, in culture, in the arts, in the voluntary sector, in, in, in the media, in all the places where England today is marked by its absence. Uh, but this is all at heart about how the people of England feel about each other, relate to each other. But it needs a national state expression too, a parliamentary forum, probably by allowing the Commons to determine English business separately, separately that allows England to debate its future. It needs its own machinery of government. And when we talk as politics does today about devolution within England, we should recognize that to be English is very often to be from a particular place within England. So effective devolution from Whitehall to local democratic institutions need to reflect that sense of belonging, not a map drawn up by Whitehall technocrats. And if we do that, we can further deepen our sense of belonging the things we hold important in common and places where we can express the strongest, uh, express the common good. I mean, even the strongest unionists would recognize that nation building can no longer just be about Britain or the United Kingdom. We're no longer a single unitary nation state, but becoming a union of nations. But I think as England develops its own national political identity and leadership, and as empowered localities choose their own representatives, it'll be clear that both England and the other nations of the UK are plural polities, with different people from different parties winning power legitimately in different places. And in that, good government will be less about a winner-takes-all politics, and more about leadership, cooperation and collaboration across places with different leadership and politics. And I think working in a different way in those new institutions can only help to institutionalize a politics of the common good. So yes, if we want to have civic virtue and common good, 
we do need to look at the institutions that we are lacking that can enable those to flourish. And I do believe that has to be at the level of the nation, not just what happens at local level. John, thank you very much. That is a, a nicely provocative uh, presentation, if I may say so. Uh, and I know a reflection of the um, fantastic work that you're doing at Southampton in the Southern Policy Centre. I, I'm struck by something you said at the beginning, which was, I think it was four-fifths of people who described themselves as strongly English, or the implications of it were that four-fifths of the people who describe themselves as strongly in, um, English don't have many options for a sort of healthy expression of na national civic virtue beyond beyond sport, really. And that that is one of the causes, not the only, but one of the causes of this kind of tribalism. Um, and you've brought us back to the idea, or brought us to the idea of England being a locus of those institutions as, as a kind of nation. But I'm also it brought to mind the work that David Brooks has done through his Weavers Project in the States, the Social Fabric Programme I chair onward, where we publish on kind of double devo. Um, and the lesson from that is that actually, if you want the closer power gets to people, the more trusted. Um, that power is by those who's wielded, or the more, more trusted the people who wield it are to those um, they wield it over, the more unified decision made, the more practical, i.e. the less ideological and perhaps the more virtuous. So is England really the right locus for that as a national institution or should, or as a, as a level of national institutions? Or do we really need civic, much more civic um, infrastructure at a level that England doesn't really do, which is closer to people at sort of parish town type level. Um, is England a distraction when actually we need better control over the things that influence our day to day lives? No, because we've got to stop posing it as an either or and see them as part of a whole. So um, I've actually, you mentioned onward, I've just been reading their report on mayors and, and, and writing about it today. And the reality is one of the reasons that devolution doesn't happen is there's no coherent government of England and there's no expression of England within our political system. So, um, you know, Michael Gove can be as enthusiastic as he wants, but the education department doesn't want to play ball. DWP doesn't want to play ball. Bayes is messing around. So nothing ever happens. So you won't actually get the flourishing in localities and what you call double devolution, which goes beyond the local states into local communities without also having an expression at that national level. And after all, you know, on, on issues like Brexit, where I talked to, but many of the other issues, these are, these are, these go beyond the locality. So I think we have to, I've talked about England tonight specifically to be provocative. I think the mistake though, is to think that it's a choice that you have to make. You have a localist focus or a national focus. And within the union, the, the inability of England to understand itself is what's putting the, the union at threat at the moment. I mean, we have a, a government elected by a minority of English voters imposing a very English view of what the union should be like over very, every aspect of the union. That is also a problem for us. So, so I, I reject the premise of your, your, your case, but I don't argue with you about the importance of localism and of local activity as a part of this, but it, it will never make up the whole. And, and can I just ask you, thank you, John, and can I just ask as a follow up, therefore, what institutions do you think England needs to deliver on that ambition of yours? Well, I think the critical thing, um, and you can argue about how you do it, but it needs, I would say three things in terms of the, the state, it needs a national forum. I mean, you could talk about an English parliament and then get into a very deep debate about setting up new institutions. You could evolve that from within the House of Commons. So there's clearly a place where English legislation is made, it's debated by English MPs and ministers are held accountable for what they do for England. So that's one uh, an important part of it. Devolution within England is complementary, not contradictory to doing that. But thirdly, there's a wider social, small p political project here which is to actually get faith organizations and others engaged in this idea of what should it mean to be English in the 21st century. Football is a fascinating example of where you had um, a diverse English football team with huge popular following 
And when they took the knee last year, I'm afraid bits of the Conservative Party, probably not just these bits of it, thought, ah, these are English fans. They will hate the idea of taking the knee because they don't like sort of this sort of anti-racist gesture. And the government got severely embarrassed over it because it turned out that most English football fans were perfectly happy to have a diverse team. But in every as other aspect of life, you will rarely see England represented in any 21st century way. So the nation building, I talked tonight particularly about the state, but the project of nation building has to engage a much wider section of society. And one of the difficulties we have is that things like the media and cultural organisations tend to be dominated by people who do not themselves identify strongly as English. And they tend to be unsympathetic to that debate and to that argument. Uh, so you can't do this all through state action, uh, but there is a challenge there I would like to be to be provocative to, to the rest of the institutions of England to engage in this discussion. Very good, thank you. Jesse, I, I, we've got a question in from Shane, I'll come to a second, okay. but I just want to come back to you as a parliamentarian, as someone who has been active and thoughtful um, on constitutional reform, um, uh, uh, sometimes to the benefit of Conservative governments, sometimes uh, as a thorn in their side. Um, what your thoughts are on John's ideas about um, it's these sort of national institutions? Well, I, <clears throat> the truth of the matter is I, I'm, a, I'm an ex, I'm a, uh, I suppose I'm someone who tries to entertain the idea of an English parliament, but the kind of conservative in me doesn't quite see the full <laughs> rationale or justification for it. And uh, I'm, I'm, that isn't, that's only because I really haven't given enough thought to it. So it's hard for me to give it the attention that it deserves, or let alone anything like the attention and care of thought that John would have given it. But I am, I suppose, struck by the billion and one other things we can do short of massive constitutional change that might count as helping to build structures and practices that promote better civic engagement, better character amongst our political leaders, you know, greater, uh, 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 as it were, m moral norms that are more pro-social in general. And I, I, I suppose I wonder, therefore, whether we're nibbling at a rather difficult to absorb and digest constitutional end of, a, of what might be a very large iceberg uh, of, other, of other activities. And, and a lot of my own interest, I have to say, in this area lies less in the constitutional <coughs> The, the, as it were, the constitutional bolus we're being asked to swallow and, and more in the much wider range of other things. And for example, I think there's some really interesting work, I don't know if you guys have done it, Jubilee, on you know, public norms of debate and not labelling, not prejudging, you know, uh, 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 non-anonymous, you know, warm and engaged, yeah. the processes by which we reflect before we respond uh, and we don't go to ad hominem arguments and we don't you know there's all these things and just so that we can be a bit more explicit when people are doing it and it, it happens the whole time another one would be you know rampant trespassing on the on the fragile boundary between fact and uh and value reportage and interpretation in the media where we are constantly being invited to kind of cross that boundary line in a way that i don't think is always true in yeah. other areas so it, i, I it, think those it, things are really interesting topics for discussion it, could i just push back very quickly and say sure. that i did not set out to have a constitutional discussion no no of course because the the issue at the heart of this is is whether we have a national sense of belonging that we share which is a commitment to each other which actually in some ways is broader than the things we will disagree on between different political parties and different policies so it's that sense of that's the aim of the exercise is that shared sense of national belonging and commitment to each other and the sense of having a, a shared sense of the common good the institutional question which then can become the constitutional one what institutions do you need to enable that to flourish but we should never forget that the the thing you're aiming for is that sense of, na of shared national identity and belonging uh, rather yeah. than a particular Yeah, I mean, I suppose, that, I, I, can I just say, I think there's a, I, I don't disagree with that. I think the point entirely that John's making, and I think there's a lot of sense to it. I think there's a particular problem in Britain, which is that historically, most people would say that a certain kind of modesty was 
uh, perhaps, uh, you know, or deference to ways of doing things was a particularly English trait. So the idea of going on about how marvelous we are as part of an expression of national pride is self-contradictory in Britain in a way that it isn't, for example, in America, where people perfectly seem to say, well, we're top nation, we're the global hegemon, and that's because America was somehow born by its manifest destiny to uh, continental leadership and other, and then in due course to global leadership. We don't really have that view in Britain, and we don't have it in England. Why? And so, and, and, and so I was going to give a little challenge back to your to your uh, endeavours collectively, it would be that you get someone like Paul Collier on to have a conversation about how mutual uh, exchange might be a way of building up from the bottom the kind yeah. of hefting yeah. and national identification that John is talking about without having to go through this uh, worryingly potentially grandiose national debate about um, English exceptionalism. I, well, I, I, the first thing is, I don't think we have to set out to have, the English exceptionalism existed all the time the English were saying, well, we don't of course. do national identity. Of course. I mean, our, there are two things. One is our historical problem is that the world in which there was that attitude towards England, where it didn't matter who we thought we were, because basically we can push everybody else around, has disappeared. And we have to find ourselves in a world which is now different. Now, I completely agree. I mean, I mentioned the Brexit debate. Both sides of it were as guilty of British exceptionalism as each other, whether you're a global Britain person or whether you said it was our natural role to lead in Europe. These old ideas of who we are have been around for a long time. But I would, I would challenge the idea that it's grandiose. I think it's actually fundamental to the, the chance of being a strong and virtuous society that we wish to develop to a shared sense of national belonging. And it doesn't have to be around exceptionalist ideas of our role in the world at all. It, no, it I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to... Okay, um, yes, <laughs> then this is, uh, I'm very much enjoying this, but I'm also delighted to say that we've got questions coming in um, okay. from the audience. So I'm going I'm, I'm to go to those um, now. Um, so Shane McLaughlin, I think, actually, uh, Jesse, a nice segue from what you're saying about um, virtue being um, both on display and an informant of um, the kind of conduct that we carry out uh, in public through debate and so on. Shane has asked, what role do you think universities have in forming character and virtue based on your exp experience working with or in higher education institutions? What should and shouldn't universities do in this regard? Well, I think we've got you know, you've both got very strong perspectives on this. So, um, Jesse, would you like to go first and then John? Yeah, sure. I mean, let me pick up John's last point by, by making the point that I, I didn't think there was anything national, you know, inevitably grandiose about talking about English character, but that it was a danger that one might go into that process, and, and, into that area. And you can tell it because English national pride tends to be stimulated by threats to it rather than by what you might call peacetime uh, self-exploration. And it's when people start being rude about the English that they go, well, hold on a second, that's, you know, <laughs> I hope you don't mind my saying so, but actually that's not quite right. You know, it's a classic Anglo response. Anyway, so, so on universities, of course, universities have always been regarded as intrinsically linked to the formation of human character. And the reason why, in Britain at least, one of the reasons why the, uh, you know, it was a requirement until the middle of the 19th century that university dons had to be ordained members of the Church of England was because there was this incredibly close relationship between, uh, between uh, the education of young minds and their moral formation of character. So, so it's inevitable, therefore, that universities will have a role for good or ill. And that's one that remains intensely controversial uh, now. It was, it was controversial at the 19th century, and it's controversial now because, you know, are we forming personal human character if we encourage young people to be as open and as questioning as possible and as open in their free speech as possible or are we forming national character if we teach them uh, a degree of respect for others that means they never get to express views that might be controversial or might be difficult for others to hear and that's an unresolved question in our in our national debate and universities have to deal with it every day and uh, you know and it's also becoming a, a a matter for government now in relation to recent legislation my only contribution to the university's uh, freedom of speech 
bill has been to insert a uh, clause now taken up by the government, I'm pleased to say, saying that uh, foreign donations should be registered and transparent of above £75,000 because I'm worried about institutional and uh, external sources that, that might manipulate uh, how we understand the voices on a university campus. But the idea that the university is somehow in itself emblematic of the wider cultural conversation has been in our, in our, in our, as it were, educational system for centuries. And the idea that it might nevertheless be able to go past these individual specialisms and differing and often clashing voices to find something a universitas, to find something universal in them, uh, is is remains there, and I think it's an aspiration that we should all be aspiring to even now. Thanks, Jesse. John? I, I think the, the question actually asked about one's own experience, my own experience is that universities, the experience of university in all its forms provides numerous opportunities for students to uh, develop as virtuous citizens, whether it's their formal learning, their voluntary activities, the ability to self-organize activities, to understand yourself as part of a wider society in the places where you live and all the rest of it. I think universities uh, do this pretty well and have offered that for a lot of the time um, that they've been going. I don't think that means it's a formal instruction in what a virtuous citizen is so much as embedding it into the experiences that are offered to students. The issue that's around at the moment, of course, is, is the arguments about free speech in universities. And I'll be perfectly honest, having not experienced that at all as an issue where I work, I am not in, though there have been some high profile cases, I'm not, a sure, I'm not uh, sure how major a problem it actually is. I think there are two things that we need to separate. One is I think we absolutely need to be uh, very firm on the places, on universities being places where controversial views can be expressed, provided they're expressed in places and ways that enable them to be open to challenge. And I think if you lose that element of a university, yeah. you're in a very bad place. I had to confront this actually when I was a minister and that um, they got overturned by the new government because I was asked probably about 2005 to say that universities should ban Islamist speakers who were not breaking the law on the grounds that they weren't sort of conducive to the public good. And I absolutely refused to do that. And I, I took a very firm line that there are things you cannot say within the law and that applied in universities. The one thing I did say, though, was that speakers should not be uni using universities where they're addressing a closed audience, where they are not open to challenge. And I haven't changed my view on that issue yeah. whatsoever. Um, uh, and I think if we ever lose universities as places where controversial ideas uh, can be challenged, we would have lost a great deal. Thank you, John. I, I just want to challenge you, though, uh, on something that you said. And um, so I've been involved with the Jubilee Centre one way or another th since the beginning and they do a huge amount of work in education. But the idea of educating for character or of creating um, education institutions that um, have an have a explicit focus on virtue development seems to have taken off much more in schools than it has in universities. And that actually lots of universities now are simply focused on processing pupils, getting them through their courses, churning out um, academic qualifications, and really giving very little thought to the pastoral development of their students. And I think you can see that reflected in rates of um, uh, you know, uh, mental health um, issues uh, and, uh, and other problems. So... Is it really, I mean, aside from the free speech issue, which I accept is important, but do we really think in universities today are better at forming the young people who go from them than they were 100 years ago? Well, if you, if you, I couldn't talk about, well, I'm very old, I couldn't talk about 100 years ago, but I mean, if you, <laughs> if you took, for example, when I was a student at Southampton University in the early 1970s, support for mental health probably came down to a volunteer student nightline project that you could ring up 
or a single student councillor in the student union or whoever was at the, med at the, med at the medical centre. I think most universities, and this may be a reflection of uh, whether it's actually there are more mental health problems or people are more aware mm. of them or whatever, probably put far more effort into tackling mental health problems than they did when I was a student, where the attitude would have been much more one of, well, if you can't cope with your course, perhaps you'll have to come back and do a resit resit next year. So I, I actually think it's a little bit of an unfair criticism. Now, yeah. where you may be right is that universities don't have a, like a virtuous citizen curriculum. But I think if you looked at the student experience in most universities, the opp opportunities to develop as citizens are actually astonishingly rich in all sorts of different ways. Um, so so I, I, I don't, I think, share your, 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 okay. your concerns. And even, even there, even the controversial arguments about freedom of speech, which we've already sort of agreed on really, Part of that is about trying to encourage precisely the respect for different points of view and different sensitivities that Jesse was talking about earlier. And where those spill out into stopping the discussion taking place, you're in a very bad place. But the idea, I mean, you know, Jesse's mentioned a couple of times about how do we encourage people to listen to what other people are saying before we jump down their throats, I think is really uh, yeah. an important part of it. Indeed. Um so with a slight switch of tone now, um, although I do want to return back to this idea of uh, institutions, but um, David uh, Sybil and anonymous attendee, which I assume isn't their name, uh, but is a, simply a, a sobriquet, but um, have asked what is the, between them have asked what is the right balance between action by the state, the market, and what um, uh, is described as non-state, but which we might call societal organizations. In, in developing civic virtue um, and do they need to work or oh, I suppose the obvious answer is yes but how do they work together to get the right balance of responsibilities so that they're all pulling in the same direction. Um, Jesse I wonder what your studies in this area um, as well as your experiences in, 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 in Herefordshire and elsewhere tell us about what that balance ought to look like. Uh, well, what's that? I mean, I suppose it's probably 38% state and 17%. I mean, I, Alice, I don't mean to make light of the question, but I, I think it's more interesting um, without, as it were, changing the, the basis of the concern to ask the question, as it were, how these separate institutions can not just be enlivened, but also cohere with each other. And you see this. You see this a lot. Uh, for example, in primary schools. So you you mm. have a situation in primary schools where teachers will often find themselves, but they can be in state schools, they can be in parochial schools, they can be in a variety of different contexts. Um, they can be in private schools, but uh, you know primary schools where where a teacher can find themselves pulled into contexts where there is family breakdown, or there's a you know, and the, and the child is unmoored try to work out what to do in his or her own life and therefore is essentially not just in in need of of love and support but also a kind of you know a kind of advisory helping hand to think yeah. to hold on to and I, I think we would find if we tracked a human being through their life um you know innumerable different opportunities where the balance between state independent and private, if you like, suddenly, as it were, uh, mutated in a way, you know, I mean, a lot of people would say, for example, uh, you know, in, in Hereford City would say that the Scouts was an incredibly important yeah. experience, or the rugby club, very community oriented organization um, in their life, you know, but later on, you know, it, I, it's a very obvious fact that, you know, many of the People, you know, we're, we're Hereford's the home of the Special Forces, and uh, so many of the guys, and they are almost entirely men uh, in in Special Forces, are the, at least at the fighting end, are you know come out of very very difficult backgrounds, in which you know the army has given them structure and support, and that's a priceless moral virtue, as well yeah. as something that's turned out to be incredibly good for their mental health. So I'm not sure there is an answer, but I do think a, an interrogation of the way stations in people's lives to ask 
have as well have individual communities got the balance right and how might new institutions be grown and supported for those for, for the benefit of people where they are somehow unmoored or, or go missing is incredibly important yeah and perhaps this phrase it's like differently jesse you could be a, a quick answer to and then and then john as well which is should the state be doing more funding and less doing so funding of non-state actors but less actual delivery of civic institutional act building activity itself itself so you can take yes, so uh, well yeah i mean the other question is is and if it's doing the funding how should it be doing because the classic mode of doing it at the moment is by commissioning yeah and 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 of course i like i like grants i i, I to me the ideal thing that, 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 that any funder private or public can do is to say look we think you're great here's some money um it lasts for three years not a year um, do something good with it and then come back let's have a conversation but not we're going to hold you to some you know, absurd contractual relationship yeah, yeah. that requires you to do stuff deliver against outcomes not substituting our judgment for yours but where the benefit is come back and have a sense of conversation and we trust you that's why money given to uh, charitable institutions universities privately publicly charities not-for-profits whatever it might be is always better if it's if it's not tied to a donor intent, that's why if I, whenever I give money away, it's always general. Because yeah. I've run charities where some buggers tried to tie me up in some knots doing something. And it's incredibly contradictory to actually doing your job properly. Thank you. John? I, I think what follows from that is, is that it's not so much a balance between state and market, but understanding the relationship that is important. But states make markets and um, states buy lots of stuff for a start, hundreds of billions of pounds worth. What they choose to buy, whether they choose to buy the bog standard in industry standard or whether they want innovative products, shapes markets. Uh, states regulate. If you regulate lightly, you get one type of market. If you regulate heavily, you don't. Uh, that shapes the market. So those sorts of how the, the, the state invests in research and development shapes both participants in the markets and markets themselves so basically the state needs to be much more aware of how it is shaping markets and as it does that you can certainly try to make sure that you're trying to encourage the flourishing of uh, good institutions I mean I have to took one example quite widely known so-called Preston model of, of, of community wealth building where the council and the universities focus their procurement locally very much with the idea of encouraging local entrepreneurship including mutuals and cooperatives so that's that's one element of it it's how the state the state can shape markets to to help improve if you like vir virtuous organizations the second thing which is the question about partnership and it's a very interesting challenge i think at the moment with the health service reforms going mm. through I declare an interest as a as a non-executive director in one of the new health organizations during covid it was often the case that local community organizations parish councils town councils were aware of a whole set of particularly older people who weren't formally on yes. these risk registers but who needed support and that became a very important part of the covid response and it's going to be very important and challenging over the next few years to make sure that as the pandemic fades away people aren't put back in their boxes and they're understood as people who have this additional role to play alongside the the state provided services I think that's an outstanding example, <coughs> um, because what it reveals, and then that's sort of part of what, why I have this, I guess, slight prejudice or bias towards um, towards the, the ultra-local, is that I think it's very hard to know what people's sort of communal preferences are, if you're any distance from them. Um, and that, that's part of the sort of positive cycle that we're trying to encourage. I'm not saying that national and other levels aren't important, but, um, you know, it, it, it is... It was very instructive to me that the national nhs volunteers program which got this incredible level of sign up was criminally underused actually as a network except where it was docked into and utilized by um those parish town and local authorities that actually understood that they that presented them with this amazing resource that they could deploy based on local knowledge. As a national institution, I don't think it, it worked very well, particularly. Um, I'm just going to move us on, John, if that's all right. We've got a couple of other yep. questions, which I just want to, to get through before we close. The first is um, about the role of the cultural sector um, 
I know an issue that you're both um, passionate and in, about and interested in still. Um, uh, so about using our cultural institutions to to support civic um, activity. And then also, secondly, um, from Jörg, who has asked about whether it's possible to have a non-partisan civic education. Uh, I certainly hope so, or else we are doomed. Um, but it would be good to get your perspectives on how such a civic education could be delivered, um, as well as your thoughts on um, cultural institutions. So, John, perhaps I could come to you and then uh, Jesse and maybe give some some final comments as well as you're um, answering those questions. OK, well, on the question about culture, I'll just take one narrow part of it. But I think that uh, in terms of the agenda I started with, but let's extend it to the local, culture has a massively important role to play in fostering the debates about who the sort of people we are, where we came from, how we came to be here, and what we share in common. And cultural activities do that sometimes, but probably not often enough, and not in a, enough places. There was, a, there was a wonderful play put on by the Nuffield Theatre in Southampton over the last couple of years called The Shadow Factory, which was about the, the building of the Spitfire, but it wasn't a patriotic tub thumping thing. It was something that enabled people to explore this particular aspect of the city in which they lived, its history and its role in relation to the neighbourhood. To, to the nation. It wasn't um, comfortable, uncontroversial, unchallenging. Those sorts of things are enormously useful. And I think if we, they help us overcome the idea that we are, we're just here at this moment in time, rather than people who've come from different places and are going forward together. So that's the cultural uh, side of it. Civic education I mean, I'm sure Jesse's done the same. I did it as MPs. You get invited into schools to, to, to talk on citizenship stuff. I mean, God, it was awful. It was so boring, so dull. Um, I said, uh, what I believe civic education should be about, it should be about uh, encouraging everybody to believe that they have some political power on their own yep. and in concert with others. And civic education should be teaching people about how to use the mechanisms of democracy in all their form to change the world that we're in. It's non-partisan in the sense that you might want to change the world in a different way to me. We both have the same right to try to change the world in the way that we want it to go. So you don't make it non-partisan by ripping the politics out of it. You make it partisan by saying politics in the broader sense can be open and available to everyone. Thank you, John. Jesse. Uh, well, I think it's an enormous amount of what John's just said. I, I did an event the other day recently with Michael Church Esky Primary School in Herefordshire, marvelous uh, little school. And I gave them, a, you know, what I thought was frankly a pretty engaging five minute chat at the end of <laughs> someone put their, someone, one of the kids put their hand up and said, um, I've got a very important question, Mr. Norman. I said, what's that? He said, do you think it's ever appropriate to eat pizza with a fork? And I was just delighted. And then another kid came in saying, you know, what would you, what would you do to someone who put pineapple on a pizza? To which the answer is, you know, wait for them to be vaporized by a laser. Um, but uh, the point was people, you know, they were happy to take the piss out of the, uh, out of the occasion at the age of nine years old or 10 years old. And I was delighted to have a chance then to go on and answer other questions once they realized they were dealing with it, hopefully with a human being. And so I think the point is that people have many different ways to get involved in, in an understanding of politics. Of course, we don't want all politics to be partisan in the sense of being party political. Uh, and uh, it's also true that we do want people, we, we also don't want to value free civic education. Someone who thinks that a search for truth is not an important thing or that it's important to, you know, reflect deeply on what the choice of facts that are relevant to the exploration of a hypothesis is, is a person who's, you know, who's, who's, who, who's leaving value behind in a way that will never help them as a as an academic or as a student or as a, or as, indeed as a thoughtful human being. So I think we're, we're trying to find different ways to recruit them, but the idea that a conversation, a debate, disagreement, you know, hard persuasion, you know, is something that is, is uh, as it were, in that sense, a form of partisanship is going to make any civic education as dull as ditch water. And we do better to go back to um, reflecting on different forms of pizza. We certainly have a more happy life if we did that. And so I, I hope we'll get 
what should I say, um, a, 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 a pizza post party political debate. Well, I, I, that, that would be nice. Who, who's ordering the pizza? Um, no, well, quite. I, I had a lot of respect for the teachers. That's what I want to know. So I thought um, it was the right kind of school. <laughs> well, look, I, I want to uh, uh, draw things to a, a close there. Um, um, and I think uh, everyone who has been um, in the audience tonight will agree. We, we have heard two fantastic contributions, very different, uh, but both um, energising and provoking in their own way. From Jesse, first of all, talking about the the political theory, the, the, the philosophy that sits behind how we should conceive of virtue um, uh, in society, um, the importance of good character and indeed of putting virtue on, on at least a higher pedestal as the achievement of economic goals. Um, and we've heard from John who has challenged us that we need national institutions or at least the English need national institutions if we're to have a more sophisticated and indeed cohesive discussion about virtue developing institutions in England itself. Um, what I take away uh, is that we still need to give thought about not just the, how new institutions, whether new universities or, or other organizations can build virtue, but actually how we can change culture towards virtue in the institutions we already have so that they are added to the ends that they have um, rather than um, rather than uh, taking away from them. I think we've actually made some major achievements, as I mentioned, and, and mainly thanks to the Jubilee Centre in, in school education, um, where the development of character is now an explicit purpose of schools for the first time uh, in the post-war period. Um, and so it feels to me that one of the lessons I take from that is actually the, the development of civic virtue, and virtue is a difficult word for politicians, as, as Jesse talked about, but in, in the, the, the positive institution building of, of the kind of uh, organisations um, that will actually develop civic uh, virtue, which is possibly an easier way to speak of it, should be both the goal of policy in general. So whatever we do, that should be an explicit part of it, whether it's tax policy, whether it's university policy, whether it's whatever, as well as the strand in itself. Um, and to come to a point actually that John made, I think one of the ways that we can achieve that rather than just by talking about it, which of course won't do anything, but is to imbue it with a virtue itself, which is incredibly motivating. And for me, that virtue, which trumps all others, is service. And that's the heart of the programme that the, the Jubilee Centre is, is doing in it. And actually, once you focus on service, you serve it, you focus outside of the self on others. It's a remarkably unifying um, concept, as we have seen, as John pointed out, during COVID. And frankly, just so much more psychologically rewarding than the kind of identitarian zero-sum um, political power games that we see, uh, unfortunately, in too many of our institutions at the moment. So um, it feels like the beginning of a conversation we've had tonight rather than the end of it. But um, I, I want to say um, sincere thanks again to John, to Jesse, to the Jubilee Centre, and for everybody who's joined us, uh, the recording will be up online. Please do keep your comments coming um, and we look forward to, uh, to, to, to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed. Thank you.